first fucking point in that go. Well, I would say um, they could be, they've looked at some data to, to suggest that sugar maybe did not contribute that much, but actually almost in every shopping basket there is a packet of cereal. Um, I know that I buy it regularly and, uh, and I know members of my family wouldn't leave the house without eating some cereal. Um, and to look at these results and see that some of these products are high in sugar, clearly there are many people in the population who are consuming cereal on a regular basis and a lot of them are consuming those that are high so it is contributing a lot to their sugar intake during the day. Gordon Hashem from Action on Sugar, thanks for coming on. EDF Energy is cutting household gas bills by 1.3% and that saving will come into effect next month and it will amount to just £9 a year off the average bill. EDF was the last of Britain's big six energy firms to announce a price cut. They'd all been under pressure to do it because of falling energy prices on the wholesale markets internationally. Samantha Fenwick has been looking at where this latest reduction leaves them all on price. Um, the big six resi resisted calls for cut prices for a while, but after the energy regulator Ofgem, politicians and consumer groups piled on pressure, they've all finally caved in, all the big six. In the last 12 months, the wholesale price of gas has fallen by 25%, and electricity has dropped by 13%, so some of that fall is now beginning to be reflected in domestic tariffs. E.ON was the first to cut its standard gas prices by 3.5% with immediate effect. This is what David Bird, E.ON's Customer Operations Director, told the BBC when they announced it two weeks ago. We've been looking at the costs that we incur and we felt that we wanted to pass those costs on as soon as we could to our customers. Hence, we started planning just before Christmas to announce uh, this morning. For us, we think it's the right thing for our customers. It means it gives them the equivalent to roughly two weeks gas supply free. So that was E.ON, they were first at 3.5%. British Gas was second, they uh, reduced their prices by 5%. Then came Scottish Power, who reduced their prices by 4.8%. N-Power 5.1, SSE 4.1. So all pretty much around the same, until yesterday when EDF announced a 1.3% drop in their prices. Everyone happy now? Well, no, <laughs> because the cuts still don't reflect the prices on the wholesale market which continue to fall. The companies have been saying they haven't benefited from these cuts because they buy their electricity and gas years in advance. But analysts we've spoken to say that they could afford to reduce our bills by around 8% even so. That's because they don't buy everything in advance, in advance and they don't necessarily pay the on-the-day price even when they do. But Christine McGurty from British Gas 
told the BBC it has passed on as much as it can. The wholesale price is only part of the cost of the gas bill, about half of it in all, and that there are a range of other costs in there. So we've done as much as we could, as quickly as we could, to pass the benefit on to customers. And that will benefit not just customers on our standard tariffs, but on our fix and fall tariffs too. And that's about 6.8 million people in all who will see the benefit come through this year. So that was Christine McGurty from British Gas. Sam Fenny, thanks for running through that for us. And Joe Malinowski is from the Energy Shop. It's a price comparison website. And Joe, welcome to you and yours. Yesterday, the Energy Secretary of Davy was encouraging people to switch suppliers now. Um, he was uh, reacting to that rather low price cut that we just heard about um, from EDF. Is this a good time to switch? And if it is, what's the best saving that you could make? Well, actually, it's, it's been a good time to switch for a long time, and, you know, I think when politicians tell people to switch, people tend to get a bit cynical. Uh, but the, the issue is, yes, absolutely right, I mean, and it's not just now. The, the, I guess the issue with these price cuts is, yes, we've had a very small p p proportion, maybe 20 25% of what the energy companies will eventually see in reduced wholesale prices to them. Um, if you, the average cut is literally only 28% when you average across all the things. The saving from switching is over 313 based on the cheapest deals. Now, you know, just think about that, you're getting over 10. If you stay, you get one-tenth of what you get by switching. And it's not just people on standard tariffs. We've just done a piece of work here which looks at deals, some of the, some of the deals that people have signed through in the last 12 months. I mean, the point is, because um, uh, the, the, these cuts are very small, they're small and they will stay small because we have risk ahead of the election. I mean, late, the co companies do not want to cut their prices running into election and then face a price freeze. I'm going to have to stop you there because we're almost out of time. Your message is uh, check it out and uh, switch if you can. Joe Malinowski from the Energy Shop, thanks. That's it for today. Um, on the programme tomorrow, more on energy. With the fall in the price of oil, renewable energy looks more expensive than before. So how's all that going to play out? And we'll be looking at the plague of nuisance calls. We'll be speaking to a government minister about what can be done to stop them, if anything. We we'll may again tomorrow, quarter past twelve. You and yours was presented by Winifred Robinson. It was produced by Kevin Mosley. In a moment, we'll be joining Mark Mardell for a roundup of the day's events in the world of one. But first, making sense of wind, rain, ice and snow, it's Abdenaeus. Thank you, uh, David. Well, a much colder afternoon for all, with good sunny spells, but increasing showers across the north and west of the UK. These turning to snow at all levels as the afternoon wears on with accumulations in places. A strong northwest wind will exacerbate the chill for all parts of the UK. Starting with England and Wales, while a band of squally rain, briefly heavy, will continue to clear south east across south east England over the next few hours, leaving clearer, brighter, but colder conditions for all. There'll be plenty of sunshine for most, but with increasing chance of showers across the north and west of Wales and for northern England, particularly northwest England. These showers will be of rain and sleet and snow on the higher ground, and some will be heavy in places. A cold and windy afternoon for all, with highs of around 4 to 7 Celsius, and even colder when the showers arrive. Snow showers will become heavier and more frequent into this evening, so an amber warning has been issued for northwest England, particularly for Cumbria and the North Pennines, as snow may lead to disruptive accumulations lasting well through the evening, through the night, and into tomorrow morning. So stay tuned to BBC local radio stations. For Scotland and Northern Ireland, will sunny spells and very frequent and heavy showers are continuing, especially across Scotland, with some merging together to give longer spells of sleet and snow. The showers will continue to turn more to snow for all areas away from coast as the day wears on, with some heavy snow around into the evening rush hour with some significant and potentially disruptive accumulations in places. So amber warnings have been issued for central, western and southern Scotland and for Northern Ireland from this afternoon through the overnight period and into tomorrow morning. The snow may cause travel disruption again. Stay due to your local BBC radio stations. So as we head on into tonight, heavy and frequent snow showers will continue across Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern England, with amber warnings remaining in force, leading to further accumulations of places, even down to lower levels. Further south and east across the UK, but generally dry, with just a few snow showers moving through to eastern areas, but the winds will continue to be strong, and it will be a cold night for all the risk of ice in the north. Then as we head on into tomorrow, it's a cold and windy day, with sunny spells, scattered snow showers, these heavy in the north and west of the UK, the best of the sunny spells will be in the south and the east, Many thanks, Stav. In a moment here on BBC Radio 4, it's the World of One with Mark Mardell. And then at 1.45, we'll explore Winston Churchill's troubled relationship with money. What he needed was the sort of advice dished out by Paul Lewis.
In just over a year, there'll be a new state pension. Standard rate will be about £35 a week more than the old basic pension, but only for people who reach pension age from April 2016, and half of them will get less than that amount. Anyone already over pension age will continue to get what they get now. Thank goodness for simplification. Today, Moneybox Live is on the state pension. Who will get what? Will it be more or less? And what can you do to boost it? Ask your question 03 700 100 444. Lines are open. Moneybox Live on state pension, new and old, just after 3. That number again, 03 700 100 444. On 92 to 95 FM, 198 Longwave and Digital Radio, this is Radio 4. The world at one, this is Mark Mardell with 45 minutes of news and comment. The Japanese Prime Minister is keeping up the pressure for Islamic State to release the hostage this morning as news emerged of a possible prisoner swap. It's a despicable act. I feel strong anger. I ordered that we work together as one on securing the release of Kenji Goto as soon as possible. But is it the right approach? Giving in to terrorism. David Cameron used Prime Minister's questions to hit back over recent Labour claims that the NHS was not safe in Tory hands, demanding that Ed Miliband apologise for his recent tactics. A phrase the Labour leader uses in private is that he wants to, and I quote, weaponise the NHS for politics. No apology came, but the Labour leader stuck doggedly to his warnings that the Conservatives couldn't be trusted on the NHS. 99 days to kick out a Prime Minister who has broken all his promises on the National Health Service. Our weekly panel of MPs will no doubt continue the conversation on air. And the hard problem, John Stoppard's first new play in 10 years asks the question, what is consciousness? Do you ever think of yourself as actually being dead? Lying in a box with a lid on it? No. Uh, we'll delve deep into the brain. BBC News is read by Cathy Cluxton. Jordan has said it's willing to free an Iraqi jihadist in exchange for a Jordanian fighter pilot who was captured last month by Islamic State extremists. The militant group has threatened to kill the airman and a Japanese journalist, Kenjo Goto, within 24 hours if a man doesn't release the female prisoner. It's not clear whether any deal with IS would involve the release of Mr. Goto. Here's our Middle East correspondent, Yolande Nell. With the clock ticking towards the deadline set by Islamic State militants, there's huge pressure on the Jordanian authorities. Ever since the young pilot's jet was shot down during a bombing mission in northern Syria last month, the family of Muath al-Qasasba have demanded his release at any price. They've also questioned why Jordan is fighting in the war against the extremists, adding to public anger about the country's role in the US-led coalition. In a short statement, a government spokesman said Jordan was willing to release an Iraqi woman, Sajida Arashawi, who was imprisoned for her role in a suicide bombing in Amman in 2005. However, no mention was made of the Japanese hostage. NHS managers have issued new guidelines to some hospitals in England about when they can declare major incidents. The new rules, drawn up by West Midlands NHS, have prompted concerns that they would inhibit trusts calling a major incident status. But the Department of Health and NHS England says the guidelines are intended to help and are not part of a national initiative to try to discourage hospitals from declaring major incidents. Responding to an urgent question in the Commons in the past half hour, the Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, said the issuing of new guidelines was a local decision which had nothing to do with ministers. Here's our health editor, Hugh Pym. The guidelines were produced by the NHS West Midlands area team after several hospitals had declared major incidents because of pressure on bed spaces. The checklist was issued to a group, including local hospitals and GPs, responsible for coordinating resources during the winter months. They were asked to check the state of community services before major incidents were declared. In an email exchange seen by the BBC, a hospital manager says the guidelines will tie the hands of hospitals. Labour argued the guidance looked like a move to keep a &E pressures out of the news, but NHS England said the decision had been taken locally and was designed to ensure the wider impact on other parts of the NHS were considered when major incidents were declared. New figures show ambulance response times for the most urgent calls in Wales, where the health service is run by Labour, are the worst on record. The proportion of ambulances hitting the target of eight minutes fell to just under 43% in December. The Welsh Ambulance Service has failed to reach the 65% target for responding to Category A calls 
since September 2013. Greece's new Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras has said the country will not default on its Eurozone debts. But at his first cabinet meeting, the leader of the left-wing Syriza party declared that he would not continue a policy of subjection. The Greek stock market has fallen by more than 7% this morning. The European Union has warned the Greek government to stick to its commitments. Our Europe correspondent Damien Grammaticus reports from Brussels. Surrounded by his new government, Alexis Tsipras was talking tough. The Greek people, the country's new prime minister said, are suffering and demand respect. Mr. Tsipras's message to the EU and the IMF is that he wants a fair deal from Greece's creditors. And his priority, he said, was solving the humanitarian disaster that has befallen Greece's poorest. European nations will welcome the fact he has vowed to crack down on the cronyism and tax evasion that plague Greece. In an announcement, Greece is halting privatizations of its major port and the power company, sent shares on the Athens Stock Exchange down, and interest rates on Greek bonds rose sharply. Brussels, they're talking tough too. Jyoti Katainen, one of the vice presidents of the European Commission, said it was unlikely European nations would agree to cutting Greece's debts anymore. We don't change our policy according to elections. Adding that time is running out to negotiate an extension to Greece's bailout and further support. Gary Glitter has broken down while giving evidence at his trial in London for alleged historical sex offences. The 70-year-old was trying to explain why he'd been in possession of child abuse images on his computer. The singer, whose real name is Paul Gadd, denies 10 charges relating to three girls in the 1970s and 80s. The value of shares in Apple have risen in after, in after hours trading after it reported the largest profits of any public company in history. The tech giant made nearly £12 billion in the final three months of last year, up 40% on the same period in 2013. Record sales of iPhones were behind the increase. Our business editor, Kamal Ahmed, reports. The facts are undoubtedly remarkable. Profits in three months it would take Tesco ten years to make. An annual income that puts it on a par with a country the size of Portugal, Apple. A cash machine that has found the very sweet spot of selling expensive products customers love and competitors find impossible to replicate. Tim Cook, Apple's chief executive, banked those very loyal customers who boosted the company's profits by flocking to buy the new Apple iPhone 6. Fresh questions will now be asked about whether technology companies that make such vast amounts of money should be paying higher levels of tax or returning some of that cash to investors, such as our pension funds. Apple has £117 billion pounds worth of cash on its balance sheet. That's enough to pay for the NHS for a year, with some change to spare. The former leader of Clyde Cymru, Lord Wigley, has compared the Trident nuclear submarine base on the Clyde to Auschwitz. Lord Wigley, who's the party's general election coordinator, was responding to a report that the site could be moved to Wales. He told the BBC, no doubt there were many jobs provided in Auschwitz and places like that, but that didn't justify their existence, and neither do nuclear weapons justify having them in Pembrokeshire. Thanks, Cathy. There's some hope this lunchtime for the Japanese hostage Kenji Goto was being held by Islamic State in Syria. The Japanese ambassador to Jordan has said you will hear good news within the coming few hours. Jordan's information minister has confirmed that a prisoner swap is likely to happen soon. IS had threatened to kill the Japanese video journalist today, unless Jordan frees an Al-Qaeda militant held on death row. The woman was convicted for her part in a 2005 attack on a hotel which killed 60 people. Our correspondent Paul Adams is here with some of the background of this case and why this woman is important. Paul. Yeah, Mark, once again it seems we're all waiting to see whether a hostage held by the group calling itself Islamic State is going to live or die. In fact, in this case, two hostages. The Japanese journalist Kenji Goto and the Jordanian pilot Moaz al Kasaspe. The key to the life of one or possibly both of these men seems to lie with the willingness of the Jordanian government to hand over 49-year-old Sajida al-Rishawi. She's been in jail in Jordan for almost 10 years for her role in an outrage some listeners may remember. It was November the 9th, 2005, a date many Jordanians think of as their 9-11. This was my colleague Caroline Hawley in the Jordanian capital, Amman, that terrible night. I saw flames, I heard glass shattering, and then, as you can imagine, uh, panic. Uh, everyone was asked to leave, and we went out one uh, exit of the hotel. No one was quite sure... 
Three hotels were attacked that night. 60 people were killed, most of them guests at a wedding party at the Radisson. It was Sajid al-Rashawi's husband who did most of the damage, blowing himself up in the hotel ballroom. She was supposed to detonate her own suicide vest, but it failed to explode. The two of them were sent to Jordan by the then leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, Abu Musa al-Zakawi. He, he was America's number one enemy in that country until he was tracked down and killed in 2006. Sajid has been in jail ever since. What seems on the surface a bit confusing is why are Islamic State demanding the release of an Al-Qaeda operative when in some places in the world they're fighting each other? Yeah, it's certainly true. There's no love lost between Islamic State and Al-Qaeda Central, if you like, the organization once headed by Osama bin Laden. But the thing to remember here is that the roots of Islamic State, which now controls territory in both Syria and Iraq, almost all go back to the group Zarqawi once led thought that as many as 70% of Islamic State senior leaders are Iraqi, including, of course, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and lots of them first met in prisons, American prisons, in Iraq, prisons that were, in effect, incubators for the organization that would eventually emerge as Islamic State. So it's not surprising that IS is inclined to see Sajid al-Rishawi as a kind of prisoner of war. And as we saw last year, they are sometimes prepared to enter into prisoner swaps. They negotiated with Turkey to get 180 militants released from Turkish jails in return for 49 Turkish hostages. As you say, the key to any swap seems to lie with the Jordanian government, but how are people there reacting to it? This is extraordinarily delicate and difficult for Jordan. The king is a willing partner in the US-led coalition against Islamic State, but it's fair to say most Jordanians are skeptical, if not downright hostile. We've seen plenty of demonstrations in the last few days by people holding pictures of the missing pilot, Moaz al qasaste and demanding, in some cases, that Jordan leave the coalition. And to make matters worse, Jordanians felt there was a reasonable chance it would be their pilot released in exchange for Sajid al-Rishawi. Now they hear that it's the Japanese hostage, Kenji Goto, and not Lieutenant Kasaspe, who may be in the process of being freed. The pilot's father, understandably, feels it's his son who deserves to be let go. From now on, our country should know that in the eyes of the Jordanian people, al-Rishawi is not at all important compared with al qasaspi Why not let her go? When there is a hostage crisis, a hostage exchange generally would be the solution. al qasaspi is a treasure for our country. Our country should make the effort to save him. We don't yet know if the deal is being implemented as we speak. Certainly Jordan has said it's willing to hand over al rashawi if the pilot is released. Japan may be looking for a rather different kind of swap. It's hard to see how both men will be freed. And it's almost as if there's a kind of grim competition going on in the background with Islamic State, once again, in the driving seat, Mark. Thanks very much, Paul. I'm joined now by Tomohiko Taniguchi, Special Advisor to the Japanese Prime Minister. Can you tell us what the latest is, please? You just heard a word, grim competition between uh, Jordan and Japan. I think that's very much a situation that many people here in Japan are very much concerned about, because Jordan and Japan have been very much close and the bond of the closeness has been strengthened lately between uh, King Abdullah II and Shinzo Abe. And Shinzo Abe uh, gave a call immediately after he heard the news to King Abdullah II. And both governments have been working closely together over the last uh, six, seven days. And uh, uh, yes, the situation is very much in flux. We have heard uh, a lot of different stories. One says that uh, the Islamic, so-called Islamic State is willing to uh, 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 let go uh, not just one but two hostages, but uh, the other says uh, only the pilot is going to be uh, freed, so the situation is hard to uh, judge. Is, is there some sort of competition? I mean, how do you, how do you make sure that doesn't happen? Is this the right way to go forward? I mean, there's always doubts about, obviously, it'd be very good for the families if the people are released, but uh, dealing with terrorists, is that the right way to go forward? I think the terrorist is setting the stage, and we have been very much 
uh, affected by the tactics and strategies that not we, but the members of the terrorist group are just setting. This, this is very much a um, uh, something that uh, uh, we we cannot say is uh, is good. Thank you very much indeed. Well, with me now is former Foreign Office Minister for the Middle East, Alistair Burt. Is this good news to be celebrated if they are indeed released? No, it, it, it's not. Of course, there would be uh, individual joy for families, and we can all understand that. And I don't think anyone from a position of a safe Westminster studio can criticise a government for seeking to do all it can to save people and for families wanting the same. But the terrorist aim is to split uh, its opponents. It has pitted two allies against each other. It is to turn the moral case away from itself because it is solely responsible for the evil that it's wreaking. It is trying to turn this onto those who are having to make decisions. And as the uh, Japanese Prime Minister's advisor said, they are setting the terms of the trade. The only way to prevent this is to, for there to be no terms of trade whatsoever, for the terrorists to know that this will never happen, for them to be blamed completely, and for allies not to be, uh, not to be split. And as a result, somebody would die at the end of it. If this, uh, if this were to happen, um, if someone was, was to die as a result of this, the terrorist is solely responsible, nobody else. But what about the next one, and the next one, and the next one? Now, I think personally, it's marginally better to have an exchange of people than it is to pay £200 million to killers who will simply go and use the money and kill more people. But the legitimising of the terrorist group and the putting under pressure of reasonable governments and the, the appalling uh, pressure put on families is a deliberate attempt to, to create these seeds of discord. If people knew that it could never happen because there is no dealing with people, because that is the only way to protect future hostages and prevent these problems in the future, then the terms of trade would have to be different. It, it's a wicked thing they are doing. One can see the principle, but is there any real evidence that the many nations, European nations, that have paid money are, are more vulnerable, that the kidnappings have increased because of this? Well, kidnappings go on, but it's not just a question of increased vulnerability, it's what the ransom money has done. The ransom money has paid for terrorist events all over the Middle East and all over the world. That's what the money does. And we're all under threat. Uh, who is to say what financed any of the, the issues in Paris, uh, any, of the, uh, any of the killings we see uh, around the region? That all comes from ransom money that has been paid over time. So it's not just a question of the vulnerability of individual nations' uh, citizens, it's the damage done with the money that's given. Alistair Burt, thank you very much indeed. 99 days to go until the general election, and the National Health Service was again the main battleground in Prime Minister's questions. David Cameron once more accused Ed Miliband of saying he would weaponise the NHS. Mr Miliband said the Prime Minister had broken his promises. Weaponised or not, the statistics flew across the chamber like bullets, and Ross Hawkins was there to watch the exchange of fire. Mark, you could, as you